Hey everyone, my name is Dr. Dolores Tarver. I'm a licensed psychologist here in Georgia and it is time for the tea. Tea Time with Dr. Tarver is a wellness-based podcast. It is not intended to be a substitute for a relationship with a licensed mental health provider. Welcome everyone to the last Wednesday in March. March has been dedicated to all things Black women, and we are wrapping up this month with one of our most anticipated and most excited discussions, which is about Black women of faith, strength, and struggles. And we have the perfect guest on to be able to help us in that discussion. So I will not take any more time. It is my sincere pleasure to introduce Dr. Lisa Allen McLaurin, Reverend. Lisa Allen McLaurin, PhD. Dr. Lisa Allen McLaurin, an Emmy and Webby, Webby award-winning pastor, professor, and public theologian, is a Helmer E. Nielsen professor of church music and worship, and oversees the Master of Arts in Liturgical Arts and Culture degree at the Interdenominational Theological Center in Atlanta, Georgia. She is appointed the coordinator of practical ministries for the 6th Episcopal District of the CME Church, and she has authored three books, including A Womanist Theology of Worship, Liturgy, Justice, and Communal Righteousness, Orbis Books 2021. So please join me in welcoming to the show, Dr. Lisa Allen McLaurin. Welcome. Thank you so much, Dr. Tarnett. I am excited to be here. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much. So everyone, if you have questions or comments as we go along, please remember to drop them in the chat. We will be monitoring the chat so we can get those questions and comments out, but we'll go ahead and get going. And I want to start off this discussion by talking about the role of the church. It's been a place of support. It's been a place of guidance, leadership training. I think most of us, most of us have probably said several Easter speeches over our lifetimes, been to Sunday school conventions, uh, sang in the choir, were an usher, uh, were, were somewhat of a leadership position in our youth Sunday school. But these are places where we learn how to speak in front of people, places where we learn protocol. <laughs> places where we received support about our gifts and we were allowed to be able to have training and experience in this supportive space. So talk to me about how you feel that the church has been instrumental in the development of women. How has it been a resource for us in our growth and development? Thanks um, for that question. And yes, you're right. Um, many of us um, who uh, grew up in the church, this is where we learned uh, how to uh, give solos, you know, sing solos, uh, play. For me, uh, who's a, been a lifelong church musician, learned how to uh, play uh, piano, accompany, direct, um, be a worship leader, um, which has, um, you know, infused uh, my roles as I've gotten uh, more mature, older, uh, gone forth to be pastor of worship in many uh, situations, and even as a pastor. Um, uh, many of us uh, learned how to follow and, and uh, lead meetings with Robert's Rules of Order. Um, uh, we learned how to uh, administrate, uh, to um, be effective and efficient, if you will, uh, in, in different positions. And uh, the, the church, the Black church in particular, uh, has, has played uh, an instrumental role in that for many of us, uh, for women as well, uh, in, in certain uh, generally prescribed areas, I would say. Uh, it's been a little more difficult for women, uh, girls and women in some sense, uh, to um, break those stained glass ceilings in some of the uh, areas. For example, of course, you know, uh, there are churches, there are denominations uh, that, do, that do not affirm uh, women being pastors, serving as pastors. Um, and, and most denominations uh, did not uh, for, for decades, uh, centuries. Uh, but, uh, you know, of course, somebody had to be the first. And, uh, and so as some of those uh, stained glass ceilings have, have been broken, have been breached, 
uh, you know, we've, we've made progress. Um, but for, for many of us, the church was the first place that, that we learned um, what our gifts, you know, many of us learned uh, what our gifts were, we honed our gifts, uh, we were supported, we were nurtured, we were encouraged uh, through oratorical contests, through, uh, you know, Bible study, uh, through uh, training sessions, training unions, uh, CYF and, and all of those uh, types of uh, organizations. Uh, and what, what troubles me in a sense is that um, we, we have lost some of that um, in the last couple of decades. Uh, the the uh, importance of bringing our children, now that I'm a parent, I'm on the other side, uh, of, of bringing our children, of taking our children, of nurturing the children who are there. Um, my mother, uh, God rest her soul, uh, she was a youth director. So she not only poured into me, but she poured into all the children who were there. Um, and, um, and so, yes, the, the church uh, for, for all of its, you know, issues and, you know, whatever we can say about it, it has served as, it has served that purpose over the years. Absolutely. Uh, I, I definitely think that uh, we probably have not lived if we have not had a vacation Bible school cookie <laughs> or, or chili hot dog or, or spaghetti. Butter cookies and that red punch. There you go. Because because you cannot have a church gathering for young people without some red punch. Oh, not at um, all. <laughs> and and, and you, we're, uh, you bring up some things and we're going to get into them a little later about how some stuff has shifted. Mm -hmm. um, but I do want to hone in on this piece about that support. Uh, because I know that there were was a time when people really sought religious or spiritual coping as one of the first mechanisms for, for support that they would turn to before mm -hmm. you went to your doctor, but mm -hmm. before you um, consulted other people in your family, you might often um, say, hey, let's pray mm -hmm. or hey, let's bring the, the, the pastor over or let's have a discussion. Wow. Talk a little bit about religious and spiritual coping and how that coping has helped us be able to get through some of those difficult times? Right, well, um, historically, um, our, our ancestors uh, who were brought uh, to, to Caribbean shores, to uh, American shores, what would become America, um, we, we brought God with us. And so, uh, you know, I tell people all the time, one of the biggest lies ever been told is that when Africans were brought to this country, they were savages, barbarians, you know, uh, they had to be civilized. Um, but no, our, our ancestors knew God. Uh, uh, most African uh, cultures, tribes, uh, countries, they are religious. Uh, they have, you know, a multiplicity of religious traditions, but but most of them have a a God, have a high God, uh, as we would call God, the supreme God, the supreme deity. Um, and so, coming to a place that you know no one, you you have nothing. Everything has been stripped from you. You have no traditions. You have no family. You have, you know, all you have are the people around you, uh, and you may not even speak the same languages. Uh, and so you've got to figure out a, your, you know, you've got to figure out how to navigate and even make sense uh, of where you are. And so our ancestors uh, availed themselves of uh, worship in the, you know, the brush arbors, forest, woods, when they could get, you know, away um, and what we call the invisible institution. And, and that's what they did. They prayed. Uh, but they weren't just praying, you know, oh, Lord, you know, help me to be a good person or help me. No, uh, help me make sense of where I am. Help me make sense of, of what this is. And Lord, are you going to bring a, a, a halt to this? Uh, you know, is, are we going to get our freedom? Are we, you know, bring, bring our freedom, free us. Um, and, um, and as our ancestors, you know, figured out, they weren't going to 
be, you know, be freed in, in that sense of, of, of being able to go back home. They felt, they figured out they were going to have to make a home here. And so part of that uh, was working through the spiritual piece. Uh, uh, that spiritual piece became or was so important um, as a way of, of creating community. Uh, and the church has always been that. It's always been a way of creating community. Um, and so your spirituality, uh, as we began to uh, be, some of us introduced to Christianity, some of our ancestors, some had already been introduced, uh, particularly those that came from the Congo areas where Christianity had already been introduced because the oldest Christian church in the world is the Coptic church, which is in Africa. Uh, that's another lie that's told. You know, Africans didn't know Christianity. Well, many didn't because if they came from the Western, you know, uh, shores of Ghana and, you know, those kinds of places early on, um, they may not have, but some did, were. They had been introduced. But once we began to uh, understand, to navigate uh, Christianity and other faith traditions as well, um, then we began to create kind of a syncretistic, uh, you know, when I say syncretistic, you know, we, we, we brought our traditions, but we also took on the traditions that we learned uh, and that were taught to us. Um, and then that became a way of, of understanding uh, who we were, what, what our purposes were, um, how we could manage to live uh, a life that even though it was full of pain and suffering also may have had some meaning, some joy, some, you know. And so faith was a, a, an incredible part of that. Uh, faith was an incredible part of, uh, and, and when you say religious coping, so if I'm planning to escape, if I'm planning to, um, you know, ask for my, you know, to buy my freedom or my family's freedom, then I'm not just going to go on my own. Uh, I'm going to avail myself of the creator, of, of the supreme one uh, who would guide me in the ways that I need to go. Um, you know, Harriet Tubman is a, is a famous example of that. Uh, you know, she used to have these spells where she would hear from God. And so, as you know, as time has gone on, that, that has continued to be a part. And so then our great-grandmothers, great-grandfathers, grandmothers, grandfathers, you know, parents, uh, family members who have been steeped uh, in the faith, in faith traditions will tell, will tell their children, before you do anything, uh, you need to put it before the Almighty. Um, you know, if you are... Uh, there's, you know, doc, you know, you gotten some kind of diagnosis before you, you know, accept it, before you go to calling people, uh, you know, you talk to God about it. That's just been a, for many uh, of our people, that's just been a standard practice because that has helped us make sense yes. of the world in which we live. Absolutely. Absolutely. First of all, you know, sometimes when you can't say a word, all you need to do is raise your hand. And so all I could do is throw my hands up as you are out here dispelling these myths about Black folks and, 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 and spirituality. Still, yeah. <laughs> they are still out here. Yeah. Look, we, we have always known God. Um, and Absolutely. God has had many names. God has still been God. Absolutely. And so this, this uh, that, that we had to be... Um, uh, brought over and enslaved to teach us, to train us, right. to get us to know God. Right. Uh, we want to be clear. This, this is what's so interesting to me. The, the, the uh, religious instruction of enslaved persons only happened after slave revolts uh, broke out and they were killing the slaveholders. So then it began, because initially for the first about 100 years, 80 to 100 years that Africans were on, uh, uh, on these shores, they didn't care. They weren't concerned. The slaveholders uh, and the powers that be weren't concerned uh, about our faith formation. No. Um, but once we began to rise up and start killing folks. Revolting. Come on, saints. And, mm -hmm. and listen, th then it began, well, is there a way to, you know, 
could control absolutely uh, breach the you know absolutely bring this back yes. and so that's when religious instruction yes uh, came into the fore for us and, and and you have highlighted as this mechanism of control because we do know that whereas spirituality faith and the church have been sources of support they have also been used to be sources of control for people, to teach Absolutely. conditions. Uh, and you you mentioned earlier the glass ceiling, but also um, faith being weaponized. And so I really want to shift this conversation mm -hmm. into to this, right? Because this is the struggle part of, of our faith because okay. with it has come some challenges, particularly for black women. So mm -hmm. let us start there. Let's mm -hmm. talk about the struggles that black women have had with regard to messages that we have been sent Mm -hmm. um, and, and as you talked about earlier, not being able to be recognized mm -hmm. as ministers, not being able to be elected as bishops, not yeah. being able to serve in certain roles. So let's start there. Let's talk about women and their roles in churches, what that has looked like. Absolutely. So, um, and, and we have to remember that our, uh, particularly Protestant uh, denominations, uh, well, I mean, Catholic as well, but uh, many, many of us uh, who follow uh, a Protestant faith tradition um, will, will point to the Protestant Reformation and say, you know, we had, we, the, the Protestant Reformation happened because uh, the Roman Catholic Church, you know, the Pope had all this authority, had sole authority. Um, and, and so that needed to be broken. And then uh, there was this, you know, the, the issue of uh, indulgences, you know, uh, folks buying their grace and mercy, if you will. Uh, and so we had to get out of that. And uh, they didn't want the congregational, you know, congregation uh, to participate in the, in the worship. And so we, we wanted to reclaim that. And all of that, you know, very well may be true. But with that, uh, once uh, we broke off the the doctrines uh, of Anglicanism, of Puritanism, uh, uh, those those traditions that that undergirded the the doctrines that we then followed as folks in the Baptist Church, of Calvinism in the Baptist Church, in the Methodist Church, uh, uh, then we got this anti-blackness as part of that. Uh, also with that, we got this uh, uh, that came all the way from the ancient church that, that women uh, were to only have a, a certain prescribed place, um, which was not something Jesus said, um, but, <laughs> but you know, we, <laughs> We, we, we love Jesus, but we follow Paul in, in most of these churches. Uh, we, don't, we don't follow Jesus. We, we, we love Jesus, but we follow Paul. Come on, um, saints. Because Paul sets up a hierarchy. And, and you know, human beings, we love a hierarchy. Don't we? We love that. We love that exclusivity. We love keeping other people out of stuff. Uh, we claim we, the folk in the church claim we don't, but yeah, yes, we do. Yes, we do. Um, and so the hierarchy has to be God, man, woman, child. And, and they'll point to, you know, scriptures in the Bible that say this, that, and that. Well, I can point to some other scriptures that say some other things. But um, from there, and, and part of it goes back to, uh, you know, Eve being, you know, they say Eve was the one who brought, uh, you know, Same. tempted Adam, what have you, um, and brought the, you know, the fall upon humanity or whatever. But then also uh, this idea of women as weaker, uh, you know, the weaker sex, the fairer sex. Um, more emotional. More emotional, less able to handle, you know, uh, struggle. And to anybody that says that, I say, you obviously never seen a woman in labor. You obviously never uh, had that experience uh, because there's nothing stronger than a woman uh, when she's giving birth. But um, come, on, come on, but it has it has continued and been perpetrated 
uh, across centuries, uh, across millennia of time, uh, that, that women are not supposed to be the leaders. And so throughout history, women have had to fight uh, the very people who are supposed to be, uh, you know, helping them with their faith formation. You know, some of the pastors, you know, other leaders in the church uh, who then say, we want you to be a member. We want you to uh, exercise your gifts, but only over here, not over here. And uh, we don't want you to get too high uh, because then you will be out of your rightful place. Yes. Uh, and that's how faith has been weaponized against women. And they use uh, people that will do that. They use biblical uh, prescriptions. I'm, I'm teaching a Bible study right now uh, for, for a friend of mine in, in Dallas for her church on uh, the Proverbs 31 woman. That, that is one of the scripture texts uh, that as we talk about faith formation is, is laid out for women to say, this is what you should ascribe to, um, which, is, which is, you know, dangerous and uh, antithetical to a woman's, you know, real being, because, you know, that scripture doesn't talk anything about her faith formation with God or her relationship with God. Um, it just talks about her doing things that are then going to benefit her husband yes. um, and, his, and his family. Um, you say, well, it's her family too, but she's property. So she's property of the husband. But, um, you know, uh, scriptures like uh, the Esther text mm -hmm. um, are used to say, this is a woman's place. You know, Vashti should not have uh, told her husband she wouldn't come before him. That's why she was deposed. She was the bad one. And so you get uh, oftentimes in church uh, this polarization or this dichotomy set up between the, the, the good woman, the, the virtuous woman, woman mm -hmm. and, and the, the bad woman. The harlot. The, the harlot, mm -hmm. the whore, you know, mm -hmm. the street woman. Mm -hmm. um, and what it has what it has done then is it has weaponized uh, the church against women and even women sometimes against women because patriarchy, which is at the base of all of that, rewards women for holding up patriarchy. Yes. So this is how you get called a virtuous woman because you keep all the other women in line. So this is then why they get put women. So you want a leadership position, we're gonna put you over the women's ministry and we're gonna put you over the kitchen committee. We're gonna put you over the hospitality committee. And we might let you be the superintendent of the Sunday school because we really don't wanna get up that early to come to Sunday school. Uh, Cause that's you what will that's be, you, you will be in a servant role. One be. where you are putting other people before you. Absolutely. Um, you know, um, and because the Bible has been used to, to support all of that, mm -hmm. then, then women oftentimes are afraid to step out of those roles because we don't, we don't want to be, you know, again, we don't want to be in a place where we can say yeah. we're against God or we're, we're going against what the Bible says. And or, we don't want to be attacked. We, we, we know that, we, as you I said before, be, other women are attacking want, us. Right. We want to be uh, rewarded too. We want to be the good woman too. We want to be extolled and exalted and, 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 you know, praised for being a good woman, Absolutely. a virtuous woman. In decency and order. In decency and in order. Yeah. Yeah. You, and you have highlighted some really good, uh, the chat is saying, come on, teach. Um, <laughs> you have brought up some really good points because if you come into church, and, and this uh, was often my experience in church as an unpartnered mother. Mm -hmm. So if I come into church, and I, because my worth is dictated really by if I have a husband or not. Right, absolutely. Or, or my potential to get a husband. Absolutely. And so if I don't fit into that role walking into a church, then I'm already walking into a space being because I already was considered lower on the hierarchy. And you put kids above women, um, below women. But we, we all know that kids were above women, particularly yeah. if they were male children. 
Um, So we were really even underneath the kids. Um, But you walk into this space and already you are judged Mm -hmm. and and looked at in this negative way. And don't let that hemline come above that knee. Uh, and, and, And then you are almost herded. Come on now. And you are almost herded away from, you talked about the safe ministries to put women in. You can be up in this kitchen where can't nobody see you. Uh, you can you can be um, back here preparate, in preparation of things. Absolutely. In servant roles. In servant roles. The board, you know, you, you can be somewhere we can control you. At what you wear. Everything. And where you are. Absolutely. You are. Absolutely. 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 Look- yeah, how you look and 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 what you do and where you are. Yeah. Absolutely. And I wanna I wanna get into uh this piece too about what kind of messages, right? Because we know that if the church we talked about uh you mentioned this dichotomy, but we really it's more uh, I, I would even say a continuum. So we talk about this continuum of our development. So if I'm coming in, and I remember, so I grew up in a little small town, Mississippi. Um, I remember that they used to make young ladies, if they got pregnant as teenagers, come before the congregation. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Right, um, and 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 acknowledge that they had sinned, mm-hmm. and to be judged essentially by this congregation yep. of people. What kind of message do you, as we are developing as women? Where we're young girls, uh, young adults, and so we're trying because a lot of us stayed in church, even though we had some of these negative experiences, because we grew up in this system, so we didn't even hardly sometimes recognize what was happening around right. us because right. this is how things were always done. Yeah. Um, but what kind of message do you think that sends to girls who are growing into women about our worth and our value? And what are some of the ways that this shows up in terms of how it affects how men? also treat women based on some of these messages? Well, um, one of the things you'll hear a lot of people say nowadays about why they don't go to church or why they are not in the church is because the church is full of hypocrites. Um, and, and part of that uh, is that whole uh, piece, that double standard uh, that, you know, the, the boys and the men can basically act in the way they want to. But the girls and the women have a very, you know, tight line to to walk, uh, a tight rope to walk. And if they get off of that line, then they are made, they are shamed often. Um, And and, and the the man or the boy is, is never brought before, you know, or rarely brought before. Uh, and made to accept accountability, take accountability. Um, And then from that is what you get this notion of um, tempting men. You know, girls are taught, uh, you don't don't wear something because that's gonna tempt the man as if it's the girl's responsibility uh, to police the man's actions. He's a whole person, a whole human being with agency, with a brain, supposedly. Amen. Um, but, but girls get uh, saddled with the accountability, not just for themselves, but for, for the boys and the men as well. Uh, so then that teaches girls that, first of all, it teaches them that, that men can't control their urges um, and shouldn't be expected to that men can't control their urges and that nor should they be expected to. It teaches them that anything that happens to them is is their, anything happens to the girl is her fault. Um, It teaches them really not to trust themselves because then what happens is if something happens to the young lady, to the girl or the woman, and she's been taught that it, you know, you brought this on yourself, then she's like, well, then how do I know how to carry myself how do I know how to if if what I'm doing is attracting this attention or you know you're saying it's attracting somebody then how am I supposed to be um instead of just you know letting the the girl be herself because it's not her responsibility to uh 
determine how a, a boy or man is going to react to her or going to, you know, uh, relate to her instead of teaching boys and, and men, uh, yeah, you don't, don't put your hands where they don't belong. Don't, I don't care what you see. I don't care how good what you see looks to you. I don't care uh, what you think is going on here. You, 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 you know, behave in a, in a way that says I have uh, agency over myself and I have good sense uh, to keep myself to myself. Absolutely. Uh, Come on, boundaries. Then what it does is it lets boys and men off the hook. And we perpetuate this we in churches, right? This, in churches. And, and this is how uh, we have had so many people be abused within faith-based institutions because we have essentially given permission. Absolutely. And then you hear, you know, uh, leave, leave them all fast, tell girls alone. Leave, you know, as if the girl can do anything on, by herself, she has to have a willing partner. And she had to have been taught. <laughs> and, and, the, and, boys, and, the boys never call fast. Absolutely, she absolutely. Manish, but but then that said with a, a positive thing. That yeah. is a positive. Oh, look at that little manish boy. Like that's a positive. Whereas yeah. girl being fast um, is said yeah. in a very negative way. And you're absolutely right about like we we have to move away. Uh, Reverend West is teasing me in this in this chat because she yeah. said, "Look at my face," um, because this is one of the issues to me that the church really needs to do some training around. Um, we have got to stop sexualizing our girls and we have got to stop giving permission for our boys not to have boundaries, but not you know, to recognize humanity in people and not see them as objects. Yeah, but you know what's interesting? That what's that? Just, I, so many people in the church don't want that training. They don't want you to do it. They, they, they are so afraid and what they will say, because I've heard it. Oh, all that's going to do is get him permission. First of all, <laughs> people don't need permission to do what they're going to do. They're going to do it with, regardless. If they want, saints. they're going to do it. But uh, they don't want w girls and women empowered. They don't want it. Because then that's going to upset the apple cart. Mm. That's then going to empower them, women and girls, to say, hey, uh, I'm not doing that. That's not, that's not equitable. Uh, yeah, why are, you, why are you telling me that, but you're not saying anything to the, him? Uh, yeah, I can, I can uh, aspire to anything in the church I want to aspire to. Then you get... Uh, they know that's going to open up uh, the ability for, for girls and women to ask questions. Mm -hmm. And a lot of church leaders don't want that because they so, don't want to deal with the questions. So my question to you, because I know you have a lot of these conversations you do. So how do we, because we know that, that, that faith-based institutions are not always safe spaces for folks. Absolutely not. Um, so how do we, one, as parishioners, figure out if a space is safe. We'll start with that one. And then I want to get into what kind of training we do need to be doing in churches, whether they want it or not. Um, so talk, talk to, for women on here who, and, and, and I don't know a woman that hasn't had somebody violate her space mm -hmm. um, in some kind of way over mm -hmm. her lifetime. Mm -hmm. So what are some ways that women will know, like, hey, this environment is not a safe space for me. This is a place um, where uh, faith will be weaponized against me or mm -hmm. I will be put in, in a servant role, or I will be looked at uh, on that range from, from being chased uh, over here to being uh, a, a whore, as you said. Mm -hmm. How do we know what a safe space is supposed to look like? Because a lot of us grew up in spaces, honestly, as we look back that we're not safe. Yeah, uh, well, I would say to, to any girl or woman going into a church or, or you know a faith-based institution, look at the leadership. If you don't see any women in leadership, leave, get out, <laughs> run for the hills. <laughs> uh, if you don't see uh, any women, uh, if, if you see women, well, let me back up. If you, if the, the rhetoric you hear 
uh, from the pulpit uh, or from the podium on the floor uh, is that, you know, women are to be um, scrutinized, uh, watched. Uh, if, if it's always something negative coming across about women are doing this and, and, and they used to do that and they're not doing that anymore. And, you know, um, you know, you hear the, the negativity, the derogatory comments, or there's some shade as, as people are want to say now, uh, where women are concerned. Uh, yeah, that, that's, I can tell you that's not a safe space. It's not safe. Um, because that then is the rhetoric that's being pushed out in, into the congregation. So then that's what's going to get duplicated. That's what's going to get uh, spun, you know, sent out there. Um, as your leadership is, so, so your organization goes. Um, and so, yeah, if, if, if you don't see any women in real, well, I won't say real, but in uh, equitable leadership positions, where they have autonomy. See, that's the key. If you are in a quote unquote leadership position, but you don't get to make any decisions, you're not really in a leadership position. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah. Um, if you don't have any autonomy, mm, mm, mm -hmm. uh, when I have served as pastor of worship mm -hmm. in churches, one of the first things when I'm interviewing, uh, yeah, or, or let me just say, because in a sense, some positions, yes, you have to work collaboratively, but whatever is supposed to be under my purview, I should be able to make decisions about that and bring that then to the table. Uh, that's just like when I've been a choir director, um, you know, give me the, the uh, order of worship and I will put the, you know, put the music in, program the music in, and, and that's my purview. Don't come to rehearsal trying to run my rehearsal. Don't get in my face on Sunday morning, you know, talking, ask me, do I know the song Jesus Cook with Chicken Grease and I've already prepared my program. <laughs> you know, do, if, do they have any real power? Because if there's not any shared power with women, that it's not safe. Uh, look at the women, listen to the women who are up talking. How do they sound? Mm. Do, do they sound accommodating to patriarchy? Mm. Mm. They sound um, free, liberated, confident. Are they constantly looking over their shoulder to make sure they're not saying the wrong thing? Mm. Yeah, it happens. People might be listening and like, that doesn't happen. It happens. I've seen we, it. Look, we saw this with Derek Jackson and his wife uh, uh, when she was on and, and we were like, sis, blink if you need help uh, because it was robotic. Yeah. the way that she was speaking yeah. and I you know we know that she was in trauma and she was in pain um but she was doing as you mentioned before this dutiful wife so I'm going to stand yeah. beside him even though he has embarrassed me uh nationally yeah. and I have to walk with the shame of that because I did something to cause you to cheat because uh, yeah. that's that's again what the responsibility falls on responsibility falls on us that you are not yeah. able to to manage your yourself yeah. as a sexual being um, so yes we 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 know what you're talking about so we <laughs> we are not under any illusion that it does not happen that women are terrified if yeah. they step outside of that you mentioned that tightrope if I step outside of this tightrope um, that I'm going to fall and I'm going to hit the ground and these people are going to take their hands off me and I'm going to be by myself shunned and ostracized yeah, and that is terrifying it is it is especially if that's been your place of comfort uh you, uh, you know of growing up support uh, of, of support uh, you know yeah it, it can be very terrifying Absolutely. Absolutely. You use this terminology as we talk about how to create these safe spaces and recognize when a, a space isn't safe. You use this terminology and I like, I like it. Um, and I want you to talk a little bit about it. Being a womanist in an androcentric culture. Yeah. What does that look like? And this male dominated oftentimes um, world of faith and religion and spirituality. Mm -hmm. What does it look like 
to show up and be me woman uh, mm -hmm. who has all of the aspects of what that entails as opposed to this tightrope. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the, the world in which we live um, is designed uh, for, for and has been for men to succeed, but a certain type of man to succeed. Um, and men of color uh, can succeed if they are willing to buy into a white supremacy. Uh, in a, in a sense, I mean, not, I'm not saying you got to go around with a KKK hood. I'm, I'm saying white supremacy is so insidious. Uh, it works uh, in so many different ways. It has tentacles that are just so far reaching. Um, if you are willing to buy into that, to, to be part of that, uh, then, then you can have some modicum of, su of success. Uh, and part of that is being patriarchal. Um, and so, yes, androcentric culture uh, where men are seen as the, the top of the food chain um, and, and they get all the perks, you know, and all of the, you know, whatever. Um, and, and somebody, may, some man may be watching saying, well, I don't get no perks on my job, but I can guarantee you the woman working there gets fewer than even you may think you get. Because whatever you don't get, you don't have to be bothered with somebody probably sexually harassing you on top of not getting any perks. Um, and so being a womanist, and so womanist is uh, a, a field of, us, uh, of theology, sociology, uh, you know, in a sense, founded. Uh, by uh, Alice Walker, um, who, who defines it in terms of um, holism, holistic being. Um, and she has four, four tenets. It's so interesting because I've been teaching on this uh, for the last, mm, definitely for the last month. Uh, but, but, but since the book came out uh, in November uh, 2021, I've been uh, talking about this. So this, these four tenets of radical subjectivity, traditional communalism, redemptive self-love, and critical engagement. So radical subjectivity is this ability to walk in agency unapologetically. Because you will have women who walk in agency, but they tiptoe. They, they're afraid to you know, step on any toes, they're going to walk in agency, but to a certain point. But what, but what Alice Walker is saying is, no, we don't come in the room like that. We come audaciously. We come uh, outrageously, you know, full of our own, you know, being right. and confident yes. and competent yes. uh, in that, making no apologies uh, for who we are, uh, which, which, first of all, scares some folk to death. For a woman to be of her own mind and possessed of her own being scares some folks to not just men either, scares some people to death, uh, particularly in the church. Mm -hmm. um, uh, this traditional communalism. So this being means committed to survival of the whole people. Um, this holistic way of seeing her being in community. So what I do, I don't just do for the good of myself. I, I do it for the good of my community. And strong women make strong communities. Come on, preach. Yeah. If you uplift the women and, and, and affirm and empower, that's your, that's your success, right? They will take you wherever you need to go. Uh, redemptive self-love. So Alice Walker says a womanist loves uh, the folk, all of them. Um, you know, loves uh, music, loves dance, does not shirk back uh, from enjoying her life. 
but most of all loves herself regardless. And so I don't need to get my sense of self-love or my sense of love uh, from what I do, which it seems the Proverbs 31 woman has to do, uh, uh, get her sense of empowerment and being from what I do, but just from who I am. Uh, yeah, Anna Julia Cooper said, I, I decide the black, only the black woman can say uh, when and where I enter. Um, and then critical engagement. And see, that's scary too. All of these tenants uh, are scary uh, for folk who don't want to deal with the possibility that women will see they are not doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're not living up to the standard they set for themselves and for other folk. Um, they're gonna have questions. Critical engagement means that I don't just accept what somebody tells me. I come with the hermeneutic of suspicion. Um, and, and just cause you say it's in the Bible, it, there's a lot of things in the Bible. You can make the Bible say whatever you want it to say. Can't you? Um, but, but because I have agency and I'm, and I'm critically engaging, I'm asking questions. Uh, I'm dealing with, uh, myself, not just as a woman, not just as a black woman, but a black woman, uh, who, who deals with class issues, um, you know, it's, it's not just sexism, it's not just racism, but it's class and it's also gender. Yes. And uh, I think a lot of times, uh, particularly uh, in the 21st century, um, and, and we hear all of, of the, uh, you know, the rights, you know, the people's rights, people are, are, are fighting for rights. I, I think the church has, become, has, has shown that it is, in some sense, afraid to deal. Afraid to and speak we, out. And we know that if we empower women, then that's going to lead to other, you know, conversations about empowerment. Absolutely. That, that many in the church don't want to have. And I think that's why some people have found or felt that the church has not been relevant to them. And why Absolutely. you see that now you're having gaps of generations in churches because people are like what what are you doing that's practical what do you we're out here watching people die we're and out here watching people not being able to eat that's exactly why the last uh, couple of uh movements that have been started like black lives matter uh, and others they weren't started in the church you know the black church you know was the the the, the bastion of the, the the crucible of the civil rights movement but that's not the case anymore. And, exactly. and uh, because I did some research on this uh, for the book as well, and, and one of the reasons is the young people said they don't want us. They want us to come in a way that's comfortable for them. Mm -hmm. They want us to look like them. They want us to dress like them, act like them, talk like them, mm -hmm. uh, 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 you know, be identifiable that they can recognize, you know, um, but, but, but we are not, how, you know, we're not bowing down to that anymore. We can start our own movements. We can, we can say our own things and in our own way. Where nobody cares about our hemline and nobody cares about our hair. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, and, absolutely. And nobody uh, is, is um, laying out these hypocritical, yeah. uh, you know, standards. And rituals. And rituals. Rit yes. Uh, and hoops for us to jump through. Absolutely. To even get you to be able to just speak to me when I walk through the doors and acknowledge my presence. Just to speak to me when I walk through the door. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm hearing you say that in order for the church to remain relevant, in order for the church to be able to show up for Black women, in order for the church to be a part of the empowerment, and I, and I love... Um, this integrated sense, these four tentons, tenants, tentacles, as you describe them, they are, they are an integrated woman. And mm -hmm. this is what womanhood 
looks like. Mm -hmm. We show up with all of those things. We show up walking head up. We don't show up cowered down. Absolutely. We show up asking questions and being engaged in critical conversation. We don't show up just saying, oh, okay, I'll do whatever you say do. Absolutely. Absolutely. We show up and we do for our community because our community is a part of us. Mm -hmm. I am because you are and because you are, therefore I am. I, so I, I can't exist outside of my people because mm -hmm. I am them and they are me. Right. But I'm very clear, you know, how I'm going to show up. Mm -hmm. I get to dictate that. I get to decide that, Absolutely. how I'm going to show up. Not, not some patriarchal, repressive system um, mm -hmm. that, is, that is rooted uh, often in, in, like you said, racist tenants yeah. uh, that is telling me who I am. It, it already tried to strip away who I was. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and so now I'm going to say that, hey, you're, you can continue to keep stripping away at me. The more I learn about myself, the more you say it's not okay to be you. Uh, so as we're talking about navigating these spa safe spaces and a church being relevant to our communities, but also to Black women, we have got to make room for all of who a Black woman is. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. So what would you say to women who, because you mentioned this glass ceiling, because somebody had to be the first, somebody had to be the first bishop, somebody had to be the first presiding elder, somebody had to be the, the first minister, right? So there are these, so for women who do want to, because we all know it's a struggle, to take on that challenge and address some of these issues, as you said, when they say, no, nah, I want to do that training, no, nah, I want to address that, for those women who are not going to just sit back and say, that's okay. Because mm -hmm. some of us are going to leave. Some of us going to bounce. And we, like you said, when we walk in and we're like, oh, no, I don't see none of me up in here. Let me leave. Yeah. But some of us are going to want to do the work. Let me address this. Because that may be what I feel like I'm called to do. So for yeah. those women who want to address it, mm -hmm. what would be some recommendations you have for them in terms of how, one, what they need? Lord, I feel like the whole arm of God. <laughs> what would they, yeah, <laughs> what that. would you recommend yeah. to them in order to begin to start this process in their own churches? Um, well, first of all, I think anybody that's gonna undertake uh, something that they have to be called to it. Um, and, and only you and God know whether you're called to it. Mm -hmm. And so if you're not sure whether you're called to it, you need to get sure before you start, before you begin. Um, and then I would say, uh, try not to go at it alone. You know, gather a, a group of people. It doesn't just have to be women either, you know, um, who are like-minded and, and willing to, to take the, the barbs and the arrows and all that's going to come at you um, when you say this is the ministry that I feel like I'm called to or this is the calling uh, uh, of what I feel like we need to be doing, uh, you're going to get pushback. But everybody who ever accomplished anything got that. And so if you're going to accomplish it, you, you're going to have to be willing to stand in what you believe uh, under the power of the Holy Spirit and say, uh, yeah, this, this is what God is calling, not just for me to do, but for us to do. Uh, for uh, this, you know, our children or our young people or wh whoever uh, is going to be, you know, part of it. Um, but you got to be willing to, to take those uh, bad days to take, you know, the, the, the mocking and the anger and, you know, the, the whispering and the whatever may be coming at you that came at any woman or any person who attempted to, to do something different or do something, um, you know, that was groundbreaking. Um, you know, if it, was, if it was easy, everybody would do it. Come on. <laughs> and so um, talk with some people who may have already done something akin to what you feel called to do. Uh, you know, read some books, do some research. Um, Find out, uh, you know, kind of how you want to address uh, the issues of it. Um, if your congregation is not a safe space and you want to take that on, then 
you know, you're going to have to build a network uh, of folk who will work with you. Because to even get people to admit that, that their congregation or their church or their institution is not safe, you know, that, that's difficult right there. Um, so you might have to, you know, amass some testimonies from folk to say, it's not just me saying this. Yes. Um, and, and then, you know, you got to stay on the battlefield. Mm. You're not going to win the war in a day. You, you got to stay on the battlefield. And, and you may not complete the work, mm. but that mm -hmm. doesn't mean you get to abandon it. Yeah, yeah. Because sometimes it, it is us that is the footstool. It is us that is the shoulder Absolutely. for someone else to stand on to get there. And yeah. so reckon, and that, and that goes back to your point. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for every... Um, woman who was the first woman ordained, there are at least a hundred more who came before her who were fighting, 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 and finally that that glass, that stains glass seal and shattered. Yes, yes. So I'm hearing you better have a, a not only this prayer, but a plan. <laughs> That's correct. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Dr. Lisa Allen McLaurin, thank you so much for coming on Tea Time with Dr. Tarver. I do want to give you an opportunity because uh, the book sounds like something people need to have in their collection. Can you talk to our viewers about, again, the name of the book and where they can, there it is, bring it on on there, uh, <laughs> from where they, from whence they can purchase it. Yes. So it's a womanist theology of worship, liturgy, justice, and communal righteousness. And you can purchase it from the publisher, orbisbooks.com, or you can purchase it from amazon.com or any bookseller. Um, you, you can get it. Um, so uh, please, uh, I'd be delighted uh, to hear the thoughts of persons who do. And it is available on Kindle. You can get it on your Kindle. Come on, options. Uh, options. <laughs> options. Now, do you have any social media sites you would like to share? Uh, I'm on Facebook, are under, uh, uh, under uh, Lisa, uh, Dr. Lisa Allen. I'm on Twitter at the real Dr. Lisa. Um, I have Instagram, so I am on there. I don't check it as much as the others, uh, but I'm there. And I'm having a website uh, develop, redeveloped because I had one, but I wanted to kind of update it. So it's, it's in development right now, but uh, I will get that to you. But yeah, that's, that's how you reach me. <laughs> all right. All right. So everyone, please do make sure that you take a look at that book. Uh, as we believe in supporting our people, that means we got to put our coins uh, where our mouths are. And so make sure you're supporting, sharing that information. This is a resource that's very important. And I guarantee you will be of a benefit to you. You can follow Tea Time with Dr. Tarver on Facebook, on Instagram, on YouTube, as well as wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. I do want to share our upcoming events. Naked and Unashamed will be uh, taking place Friday, April 1st, 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. The Women of Hosley will be putting on this event live and in person at the Page Dolman, Dolman Complex, and that's the Mighty Fortress on 808, 808th Street. Uh, we are having Unmasked, which is a virtual event, Columbus Metropolitan Alumni of Death, uh, Columbus Metropolitan Chapter, uh, Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated will be hosting uh, on Saturday, this upcoming Saturday from 12 to 2 Eastern Standard Time, and that is for our young people in 6th through 12th grades, as well as men and women. Uh, you are going to be seeing April episodes of Tea Time with Dr. Tarver, uh, See Me. The Voices of Young Black Women with Guests Asia and India White will be Friday, April 8th at 7 p.m. Eastern. And then we're going to be talking from Mommy Dearest to Mommy Did This, Mother-Daughter Relationships with Michelle Jones, LPC, Thursday, April the 21st at 7 30 p.m. Eastern. So join us again for our lives. Again, Dr. Lisa Allen McLaurin, we have been truly blessed. Thank you so much for giving up your time and your talents this evening. You take good care of you. And everyone, we will see you again uh, next week for Tea Time with Dr. Tarver Live. <laughs>